In this video, I want to talk about questioning and assessment of the patient who we suspect may be having cardiac ischemia. And what I want to talk about are some of those assessments that are typically high yield versus low yield. And when I say high yield, I mean that if the patient presents positively with some of these high yield assessments or questions, then those are usually quite indicative that the patient is experiencing cardiac ischemia or is at high risk of cardiac ischemia. When we look at the low yield cardiac ischemia questions or assessments, the challenge is that they are not particularly predictive of ischemia, of a patient having ischemia or not having ischemia. So we should be cautious in basing our decisions based on those assessments. So when we talk about high yield uh, assessments or questions for cardiac ischemia, the first thing I would typically position you towards is finding out what the pain feels like and recognizing that visceral sounding pain is typically going to be uh, how patients feel when they're having an ischemic event. So a visceral pain pattern is typically indicative of um, cardiac ischemia. And that's because as the metabolites are released, so as we start to see uh, metabolites released from the damaged tissue, what is going to happen is those metabolites irritate nociceptors that are found around the heart and can lead to uh, pain pattern. What's interesting about this is that people don't typically experience pain in the heart, so uh, often that becomes referred or feels a little bit harder to distinguish because they have sparsely distributed pain receptors. So uh, visceral pain is highly indicative or is a good high yield uh, assessment to do for patients because it's typically going to tell us that the patient has release of metabolites. So visceral pain is metabolite related and does suggest that the patient is activating those sparsely distributed uh, pain receptors. So uh, visceral pain is typically metabolite related as a result of ischemic or dying cells. And again, when we're talking about visceral pain, we're talking about things like a burning pressure, squeezing, and it's often often difficult to localize. So uh, patients are giving kind of these more vague-like de uh, descriptions, and they're typically uh, more challenging to localize. Now, when someone does state that they're having a visceral sounding chest pain, so I've got chest pressure uh, that is challenging to localize, that is usually an indicator for me that I should start going through additional high yield questions or assessments that would point me towards cardiac ischemia. And if I start seeing a lot of positive results to these questions or assessments, I should have a high index of suspicion for cardiac ischemia. And when I look at what those high yield assessments or questions are, usually we use the acronym REDS. Now REDS comes out of um, multinational studies and meta-analysis that look at the symptoms that patients experience when they're having cardiac ischemia. So these are patients who presented pre-hospitally with symptoms, were transported to hospital, and either ECG or blood work confirmed that they were having an ischemic event. So these are going to be things that we can have high evidence or high evidence suggests that they are predictors that people are having ischemic sounding pain. REDS uh, or the R in REDS stands for radiation. The E stands for emesis or nausea. The D stands for diaphoresis. And the S stands for shortness of breath. Now what's interesting about these uh, symptoms is that they are all indicative of metabolite release or challenges with cardiac output. And that's what makes them so predictive. So when I look like something and when I look at something like radiation, radiation is predictive uh, of a ischemic pain because it's metabolite related. So the radi uh, radiating pain is uh, very similar to the visceral pain in the sense that it occurs because I've got metabolites irritating uh, sparsely distributed noise receptors which can lead to referred pain. The other piece to this is that when I have metabolite release in the surrounding tissues around uh, the heart, it can lead to activation of our autonomic nervous system, which can lead to emesis or nausea. So these two symptoms, so the radiation, uh, the emesis, and the nausea are very similar to the pain pattern in that they are metabolite related. So they are indicative that not only is the tissue ischemic, that it's releasing metabolites, which is a good indicator of ischemia. When I look at the other two symptoms, so things like diaphoresis and shortness of breath, those are cardiac output uh, related. So usually when someone is having an ischemic event, we are seeing a challenge to cardiac output. So uh, when I have damaged tissue or ischemic tissue, that can lead to a reduction in cardiac output or the amount of blood that's being, uh, or amount of blood that's exiting the heart. So I can see a reduction in cardiac output and that will lead to activation of compensatory mechanisms. So when someone is experiencing uh, diaphoresis and shortness of breath, that is a good indicator that they have activation of compensatory mechanisms, 
which we would expect when the patient has a reduction in cardiac output. So when you look at patients who are experiencing um, a visceral type pain and they have the reds associated with them, those are highly indicative of cardiac ischemia. So if someone's complaining of a burning chest pain that radiates to their right arm, they have some nausea, they're diaphoretic and they feel short of breath, those again are indicative of the fact that they likely have some ischemia, metabolites are being released, and it's those metabolites that are checking those boxes and causing those symptoms. So it's hard to, dis, um, hard to say that someone who's experiencing all those things is not experiencing cardiac ischemia. So those should be kept in mind. Uh, as always, we should pair this with our history findings. So the other kind of high yield pieces to this would be the history findings that we have for this patient. So uh, history findings are going to, again, basically just tell us um, or give us an index of risk for this patient and find out what patients are at high risk. And there are a few core things that increase the risk for ischemia. So we have to remember that we're looking at things like, is the patient a smoker? Do they have history of heart disease? So has the patient had a heart attack previously, or do they have a family history of heart disease? Does the patient have hypertension? Does the patient have high cholesterol? Is the patient obese or overweight? And does the patient have diabetes? So again, these are big risk factors. So the more of these the patient has, the higher risk they are for atherosclerosis, and that puts them at much higher risk of cardiac ischemia. Uh, so these all increase risk. So when I'm looking at someone who's presenting with these symptoms and has these risks, I would be I would have a high index of suspicion that they're presenting with cardiac ischemia. So again, when I'm thinking cardiac ischemia, these are the things that I look for first. My first questions, my first assessments, because we know one of the treatments that we want to get on board for these patients is aspirin so that we can stop any clot that's getting worse or bigger if there is one that's there. So those are the high yield kind of questions. Doesn't mean we're not gonna ask other things, but that's kind of how I would position myself when I'm uh, assessing someone for cardiac ischemia. Now, when I talk about low yield assessments, I wanna talk about a few things that people typically will use as an indicator of ischemia or not. And one of those things is the reproduction of the pain. So how reproducible the pain is, so if it increases when you push on it or when the patient moves, is not typically a high yield assessment or it's not particularly predictive of uh, cardiac ischemia or not being cardiac ischemia. So one of the things I wouldn't put a ton of weight in when I'm assessing the patient is how reproducible is the pain. And again, the reason for that is uh, when they look at the signs and symptoms related to cardiac ischemia, those patients who have reproducible pain, that is not a good indicator that they don't have cardiac ischemia. So what they found was a lot of cardiac ischemia patients may have had reproducible pain on assessment. Again, the presence of reproducible pain is not enough to say this is not ischemic, especially if we have more of these high yield questions over on this other side here. The other thing that comes up sometimes is the patient's response to nitroglycerin. Um, so maybe I give a couple sprays of nitroglycerin and the patient does or does not respond. That is not typically a high yield assessment for whether the patient is or is not having uh, cardiac ischemia. So again, response to nitroglycerin is not typically um, going to be something that is highly indicative of whether the patient does or does not have cardiac ischemia. If they do, we'd like to see them respond to nitroglycerin, but just because someone is not getting better when you're giving them nitroglycerin does not mean that they don't have cardiac ischemia. So response to nitroglycerin, again, it's low yield. It does not typically uh, directly correlate to whether the patient is or is not having an ischemic event. And then finally, ST elevation MI, so STEMI or ST elevation on the cardiac monitor, is a very highly sensitive finding for heart attacks. So the patient's having an MI. The absence of ST elevation is not a good indicator that the patient is not having an ischemic event. So angina will typically not present with ECG changes. So we should not be basing our treatment findings of whether we're giving ASA or nitro to a patient based solely on whether they do or do not have elevation on the, uh, the 12 lead. So the absence of ST elevation is not a good indicator that the patient does not have ischemia. So absence of elevation is not predictive of whether this patient is having an angina event or not. So we shouldn't be using that as our guiding uh, force. Another common myth that we often see is that the radiation must go to the left arm. 
So radiation to the right arm being used as a factor to rule someone out uh, for cardiac ischemia is a poor uh, use of uh, tools. So radiation to the right arm is actually more common in patients who have cardiac ischemia, but simple, simply having radiation is the high yield piece. So where it goes to is less relevant. It's if that pain is radiating to the left, right arm, jaw, neck, back, the presence of that radiation is a high yield for the patient having cardiac ischemia. It doesn't have to be to the left arm. So radiation uh, to a particular arm is not uh, necessarily relevant here. And finally, I wanna talk about when to be cautious with our assessments for cardiac ischemia. Um, there are a few uh, different types of patients who will present atypically. So these include uh, elderly females, diabetic patients, and obese patients. For these patients, um, there was a high number of uh, these patients who presented with symptoms other than these big high yield symptoms, but they did have a lot of risk factors and it ended up that they were having cardiac ischemia. So sometimes the patient may only present with some of the core findings of ischemia, but they may have a, a contextual factor that puts them at higher risk of having an atypical presentation. And what that would mean is that I would base my decision a lot on working diagnosis and risk. So what else could it be? Do I have a good working diagnosis? And how many of these risk factors do they have? So again, we have to be cautious in these three patient subtypes because they can present atypically, or we can see atypical presentation.